Welcome Climate Viewers. My name is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at ClimateViewer.com, ClimateViewer.org, and WeatherModificationHistory.com. It's uh, May 28th, 2018, and tonight we're going to do the big picture, how to geoengineer a planet with jet fuel. Um, this is the smoking gun stuff everybody's been waiting for. This is all the scientific references and historical references you could possibly ever want. This is the video you're going to send to everybody who ever told you chemtrails were not a thing and that, uh, you know, planes making clouds aren't a big deal. It's just water vapor condensation. This is how you shut them up permanently. Um, if I can do this, you can do this. And I hope that you guys will pay close attention to this video because it's going to be pretty freaking epic. Um, so... I'm over here at climateviewer.com. Many of you guys have already been to my website. Um, all of my major pages are right here on the top on the front page. But uh, before we get to that, I'd like to mention that all of my research is free of charge, um, advertisement free, and of course I am only supported by my Patreons. Um, thank you to all my patrons that have already signed up and the occasional PayPal donation. Um, so if you guys would like to donate and buy me a coffee, you can do that right here at the top of the page on every single page on Climate Viewer News at ClimateViewer.com. But today we're going to talk about Cirrus Clouds Matter, the shady truth about contrails, and how to geoengineer a planet with jet fuel. This is the true history of chemtrails. This is going to be a long video. This is going to be a very informative video. I hope that you'll stick around for the whole thing. I know it's late, but this will be mirrored on YouTube and permanently placed on climateviewer.com in the near future. If you haven't caught my last couple videos, you must watch these. Harp, Harp and the Sky Heaters Full Disclosure, Geoengineering Programs and Weather Modification Experiments Worldwide, Weather Modification Yellow Pages, Names and Addresses, Who's Controlling Your Weather, and Henry Kissinger, The CIA and Weather Warfare. Um, but back to the story at hand tonight, geoengineering a planet with jet fuel. So for this, we're going to do a lot from weathermodificationhistory.com, uh, the world's most extensive timeline and history repository on climate engineering, geoengineering, weather modification, cloud seeding, sounding rockets, ionospheric heaters. Anybody screwing with your sky, you can find out all about it at weathermodificationhistory.com. And we're going to more than prove that tonight, so <laughs> get ready. So we're going to start with a quote from President Lyndon Johnson. Um, and this is a pretty epic one. And what he said was, in a, uh, a, a speech at Southwest Texas University at a commencement speech, it lays the predicate and foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to control to determine the world's cloud layer. You cannot make this stuff up. That's what he said. To determine the world's cloud layer. And as you can see, my Texas archive has now blocked us, but you can come right over here to that actual website and see that video speech for yourself. I will be uh, updating that video on here anyway. Um, but regardless, that's what he said. The guy said... Hey man, um, you know I'm I'm vice president, you know, and I'm about to be president. Let's let's control the world's cloud layer, um, and that's some pretty serious statements coming from a pretty influential guy. So th this is not a conspiracy. In fact, it goes back way to the 50s and to the present. We're going to go through that entire history in this one video. So let's move along. Over here on weathermodificationhistory.com, you can come to the Weather Modification News Vault, and you just do that by clicking on newspapers. And what you're going to see is over 800 news articles um, spanning from, you know, all the way back to, you know, the 1800s. And you see things like, uh, you know, a freaking senator saying, Hey, these mountains will always be covered in snows and the airlines will provide it. Um, so let's do some of those histor historical documents and prove our case beyond a shadow of a doubt. So we're going to start right here with Contrail Sears complaints begin nationwide 1948 to present. And uh, 
some of the quotes you can see the articles right here um recently our skies have resembled a mob of exuberant sky riders performing an aerial circus these contrails are breaking down into a haze and creating a cloud-like appearance in the sky the air force so far is flabbergasted um yeah and then dire predictions for jet produced cloud cover they said that if there were 300 supersonic transports in the air at one time, the region of operation for most SSDs might easily be 100% covered with cirrus clouds. Now, this is a long time ago for people to be saying things like this. And as you can see in the articles here, this is 1958, Jet Trails Dim Sun, Palm screen, Springs Gripes. Another one, Mystery of the Point Augusta Sky Trails. This is November 16th, 1948. Shout out to Dominic Marama, my homeboy, who recreated these newspaper articles and made them into memes so that we can make this easy for everybody. Um, Plain Vapor Trails, 1951. New fuss raised over jet trails, 1958. This goes way, way back this problem that we're all seeing in our skies today and that's because the regula the, the airline industry has never been regulated and every time they've tried to regulate them they have circumvented laws and regulations because they have a massive lobbying organization and we're going to show that coming up right here um this is also from 1958 navy scientist creates clouds breaks them up blue skies or stormy weather and what they said was right here, let's scroll over so you guys can read it nice and neat. We dropped carbon black suspended in liquid over a track of a mile long and produced a solid line of clouds one mile long, Dr. Van Stratton told a reporter. When we dropped a half, one and a half pound, pound dry packages of carbon black, we produced single clouds with each drop. The Navy team seeded seven clouds with carbon and dissipated each of them uh, from two and a half to 20 minutes. Each cloud turned gray and then rapidly disappeared. Aside from the cost of the airplanes, we spent less than $5 on the experiments in Georgia. Carbon black is normally used in printer, ink cartridges, and automobile tires and is nothing more than soot. So with just soot, the United States Navy was able to not only create clouds, but destroy them. 1958. Moving along. So the Air Force is so far flabbergasted. Well, then explain this one to me, guys. This is from 1959, Desert Sun. Air Force gives village two choices. Live with the trails or move. <laughs> so... Apparently, they're not that flabbergasted. In fact, they're telling you to F off if you don't like the sky trails. Um, and that's pretty, that's pretty telling in and of itself. So what do we got up here next? Jet, U.S. jet planes will lose their vapor trails soon. 1960. Now, we all know that didn't happen, unfortunately. Vapor trails, which in the past have dissipated... It indicated the presence of high-flying U.S. Air Force jets will be ended, the Air Force Research and Development Command announced. Air Force scientists said a breakthrough was reached after more than five years of research at LG Hanscom Field. A six-engine B-47 bomber crew following directions from the ground first eliminated the vapor trails from the engines on the right side, while the three on the left engine continue to produce familiar white vapor trails. Then the vapor trails poured from the right engines while the left engines left no track behind them. So, wait a minute. Apparently the Air Force isn't that flabbergasted. They can get rid of these clouds. They just don't want to. All right, so what's up next? So, then 1970, and this is the smoking gun one. Pardon my pun about smoking guns. Two states sue airlines over smoke pollution of the skies. This is what chemtrails were called in 1970. They called it smoke pollution of the skies. Illinois and New Jersey officials will not settle pollution suits against the nation's major airlines out of court despite Tuesday's agreement between the airlines and federal government to lean up on jet aircraft exhaust. 
Representatives of 31 major domestic airlines agreed to install burner cans to eliminate most of the smoke from their nearly 1,000 aircraft by 1972. And then the next paper. The government will tell the nation's 43 commercial airlines Tuesday that they must end pollution of the skies with jet engine smoke. So we're not talking about black belch, as it was called back in the day. We're not talking about black, you know, smoke on the ground near air, you know, airports. We're talking about what they called smoke pollution of the skies. Smoke pollution of the skies was chemtrails, 1970. So two states literally sued, Illinois and New Jersey, sued the airline industry for chemtrails in 1970. They said that the burner cans can cut out something like 70% of the visible pollution, and thus the familiar black belch will be seen no more. So that didn't happen. Um, you know, unlike most changes in the atmosphere caused by man, this one is be beneficial, said Richard Simonin of the Illinois Institute of Natural Resources. No one's trying to make clouds now using jet engines, but the study suggests that jet travel is inadvertently making our days more cloudy, and someday weather researchers may be able to use jets on purpose to change our weather. Links and references right there. All the references you could shake a stick at. Here is the actual newspaper, U.S. to clamp down on jet pollution, 1970. And it says right there, Tuesday, that they must end pollution of the skies with jet engine smoke. That is chemtrails, 1970. And that is John Volpe. He's the Secretary of Transportation who actually mediated the uh, meeting between the two states and the airline industry. And John Volpe said, hey, man, can we can we work this out? I mean, you know, us globalists and, you know, politicians, we really love to fly. And, you know, regulating the airline industry would make our plane tickets and our gas bills go through the roof. Um, but, yeah, that's a bad thing. So they, these burner cans that they said they were going to install are actually just redesigned combustors. And the combustor is, you know, the thing that actually lights the jet fuel on fire inside the engine. So they said they were going to redesign that and that would lean up on the pollution coming out of planes and that should make less clouds. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And as you can see right here in this image, which I'll bring up a little bigger for everybody at home, this is not 10 years later, because that was 1972, 1981, over the state of Illinois still. Um, this is in Chicago. So jet vapor trails altering climate over Chicago. Jet changing jets changing climate for good or ill. All the details you could possibly want on that. So the, um, the Illinois University actually started a whole study on chemtrails and vapor trails, and, and they do that to this day. So why does this matter? Because history is now repeating itself. Um, you know, this, this has been a problem since the dawn of flight that planes are putting particulates in the sky. Those particulates are acting as cloud condensation nuclei. Um, that's what, you know, all the debunkers will say, well, it's just water condensation. And what you should say to them is condensating on what? Because that matters. So condensation means water is condensing onto dust and that dust is soot and that soot is loaded with metal and that metal makes metal clouds. We're going to get into that before the end of this video. Up next. Contrails, geoengineering, and the single fuel concept. This is over on climateviewer.com. And what I realized was, you know, I said to myself, well, what was the first time that anybody ever said chemtrails on the internet? And the very first article was 1997. That's the first article that ever came on the internet with the word chemtrail in it. And do you know what that article was about? JP8 and JP8 is a jet fuel. 
JP-8 is a military diesel fuel, and what they did was they decided to switch all of the NATO planes, as 20-something countries, simultaneously switched from gasoline to diesel fuel. This caused numerous problems. Um, lengthy article on that here. I'm going to scroll down to the important parts, um, scroll past all of this. But basically, there was a couple things that happened. Propulsion research could revolutionize jet fuel. They came up with something called status, uh, excuse me, um, Spec Aid 8Q462. Spec Aid 8Q462. It's a HITS additive or a high therm temperature thermal stability additive. <coughs> excuse me. Now what that did was it allowed, it says the additive was designed to make JP-8 perform like JPTS, a special fuel used in high-flying air spy planes like the U-2. At the time, JP-8 only cost around 61 cents per gallon, but JPTS cost around 325 per gallon. So after they came up with this HITS additive, they could basically put an additive in this JP-8 fuel at 61 cents a gallon and make and put it in the U-2 spy planes and put it in all the fl high flying planes. And what it does is it keeps ice from forming in the in the fuel lines and it makes ice crystals smaller, as you can see right here on one side, big ice crystals over here with the plus 100 additive. It has smaller ice crystals. Now, smaller ice crystals stick around in the sky longer. So, if you combine the two together, what you have was switching from gasoline to diesel fuel changed the particulates in the sky. It made the ice crystals smaller. And this is a big problem. This is from the Air Force Research Lab. This article has been deleted from the internet. Of course, it's copied in my article here. Now, why does this matter? Because there are different types of fuel, Jet A, Jet A1, and then you can see JP-5. That's the you know, aviation kerosene that they were using back there. It's called NATO F-44. The new one is JP-8 or NATO F-34, and it's UK Defense Standard 9187, um, also known as AVTOR, F-S-I-I. -I. Um, lots of additives in that stuff. It's kind of creepy, but... Who's doing this? Well, it's the NATO Pipeline Committee. And what you'll look at is you realize that basically if there was somebody who wanted to geoengineer the whole damn planet with, geo with jet fuel, these are your guys. Because as you can see here, here is all the NATO countries. And guess what? That's where we see all the videos of people complaining about chemtrails. So for me, this was like a no-brainer. And I had to say to myself, well, who could possibly be behind this? Well, in this NATO pipeline committee, it's made up of three groups. The Petroleum Handling Equipment Working Group, AC-112. Um, NATO Fuels and Lubricants Working Group, AC-112, and then this. And then Working Group Number 1, which takes on special tasks as directed by the NATO pipeline committee. NATO working group number one is a group of about 12 individuals and their names are top secret. I cannot get a list of who those people are or I would have interviewed them by now. So point being, if you wanted to geoengineer the whole planet with jet fuel, all you need is NATO pipeline committee working group number one to say, hey, let's put this in the gas tank. And then suddenly that stuff would be sprayed in 28 countries simultaneously and that's exactly what happened because if you look at what happened this is a, a a breakdown of what's in the jet fuel and you can see right here jp5 is what they were using they switched to jp8 this was called the single fuel concept and when they did that the aluminum went from 2100 parts per billion to 9300 parts per billion Strontium went from 70 parts per billion to 351 parts per billion. Titanium went from 35 parts per billion to 1,000 parts per billion. But the one nobody's talking about is calcium. Calcium went from 5,000 parts per billion to 31,000 parts per billion. Calcium is actually the secret ingredient that's most important in this whole chemtrail conspiracy. Because calcium also 
does carbon sequestration and it also contributes to clouds. Even David Keith, top geoengineer on the planet, switched from saying let's put aluminum in the sky to saying let's put titanium in the sky to saying hey, let's do a more gentle approach and do calcium. Um, you can look this up. This is all reality. So geoengineering with calcium. Well, guess what? NATO already did that from 1996 to 1990 or 1988 to 1996. And uh, you can read all of these. They're called Stanags. Interchangeability of fuels, lubricants, and associated projects used by the armed forces and the NATO. Um, and, you know, specifications for what goes in the fuel and all that. I'm going to skip the genetically modified chemtrails with the biofuels and stuff. This is not for another video, but I made this timeline right here and it goes like this. 1962, DuPont Status 450, that's called dinonaphthalene sulfonic acid. It is a barium additive for the fuel. 1970, DuPont Jet Fuel Additive Number 5. 1988, conversion from JP5 to JP8 starts. This is when the, the single fuel concept started. 1992, stratospheric wells box seeding patent. 1994, the plus 100 additive was invented. 1995, owning the weather in 2025 came out. 1996, conversion to JP8 complete. 1997, Weather Modification Test Technology Symposium, where the U.S. Air Force and Army met and said, let's use carbon black dust to do weather control, just like they said in Owning the Weather 2025. 1997, Edward Teller's geoengineering proposal from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. October 1997, plus 100 additive in 1,000 U.S. Air Force jets, and 1997 chemtrail conspiracy begins. These are facts. Most people don't know this stuff. And um, I'm actually going to be talking to a guy named Jim Phelps more about the calcium stuff because he apparently has the inside scoop on it. Um, hope to do that interview in the near future. Um, but this is the real, real guys. This is everything you need to geoengineer the planet is already in the jet fuel. There's the aluminum. Oh, by the way, there's the barium. It's minuscule, 9 to 38. Um, but if you really want to find a lot of aluminum and barium, you're going to have to look a little higher. I have a series on YouTube called Chemtrails from Space, and it's about sounding rockets and how they've been dumping trimethyl aluminum, barium, strontium, lithium, and sulfur hexafluoride in space for over 60 years. So what goes up must come down, and that is the truth. But... Here's where we really get to the evidence, because we love evidence, don't we? So this is a pretty damning paper if i ever seen one. System and method of control of terrestrial climate and its protection against warming and climactic catastrophes caused by warming such as hurricanes. And what do you have on the very first line right there? Let's make it really big. Here we go, right there. This system of control and protection of terrestrial climate relies mainly on civilian airlines burning, preferably price subsidized, sun shading, sun blocking, sun reflective fuels in high levels of the atmosphere in order to reduce the intensity of solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface. Using jet fuel to cool the planet. Right there in the patent, right at the top of the very first line, Mark Hucko, U.S. Uh, patent application 2009-00322148A1. But that's not all. I mean, if this was all I had, then this would be kind of weak, right? I mean, using jet fuel to geoengineer the planet, who the hell would say something like that? Well, back to my Cirrus Clouds Matter page. If you just scroll down a little bit to right here, you're going to see what are they doing about cirrus clouds. Well, these are all references to geoengineering papers saying the exact same thing. Albedo enhancement by stratospheric sulfur injections, a contribution to resolve policy dilemma by Nobel Prize winner Paul J. Crutzen. He talks about it. 
um right here this is another one right here uh let's see this is uh from the weather modification conference so i don't want to download the pdf screw it but what they say is basically you know we could uh put wide area seeding with soot or carbonaceous aerosols carbonaceous aerosols like carbon black dust um, and they could burn this from fuel and only 1.7% of the mass of sulfur is needed to produce a similar magnitude of surface cooling like Crutzen said. Use commuter aircraft fuels doped with aerosol generators. Now I interviewed William Cotton at the weather modification conference back in January of this year and that's exactly what he said. Uh, I said here in the perhaps commuter commuter aircraft with uh, the jet fuel built for the aerosols and that, uh, UAVs or blimps and that. Uh, it's got tall enough stacks for some reason, lower the uh, 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 static cumulus basis and that, uh, perhaps you could build those. And, uh, Use commuter aircraft with their, with their jet fuels doped with aerosol generators. Jet fuel doping is what they call it. So putting stuff in jet fuel to do geoengineering. This is not this is not a conspiracy anymore. I mean, I've more than debunked, you know, all the bullshit the debunkers say. Um, and these are all the facts. Dissolved or suspended in their jet fuel and later burned with the fuel reference right here. This is IOP Science. You can go and look at all of these references. They're, they're, they're clickable. You can go to the PDF. Modification of cirrus clouds to reduce global warming by David Mitchell and Will William Flanagan, 2009. I have more references on this than you can shake a stick at. Options for dispersing gases from planes include addition of sulfur to the fuel, which would release the aerosol through the exhaust system of the plane or the attachment of a nozzle to release sulfur from its own tank within the plane, which would be a better option. The particles may be seeded by dispersal from seeding aircraft. One exemplary technique may be via the jet fuel, as suggested by a prior work regarding metallic particles. A potential delivery mechanism for seeding material is already in place. The airline industry. Reference, reference. So, I mean, you can go look at all these. these are IOP science right there again. This one, last one was from Free Patents Online. That's, uh, oh, is that stratospheric wells back seeding? Oh, wait a minute. That's stratospheric wells back seeding. Everybody's heard about that. Did you read the part where they talk about using jet fuel to do it? Most people don't read a damn thing. Um, stratospheric injection of sulfur species. Oh, by the way, it'll lead to ocean acidification or acid rain when you put a whole bunch of sulfur in there. Direct detection of total sulfuric acid has been achieved for the first time in a plume of jet aircraft in flight. The measurements show the same sulfuric acid signatures for the case when the sulfuric acid was injected directly into the exhaust. So spraying it directly into the exhaust plume the exhaust jet as the case was when the sulfur was provided to the engine with the fuel jet fuel so putting sulfur in the jet fuel wow man wow uh right here injection of h2so4 sulfuric acid a condensable water vapor a condensable vapor from the aircraft Putting it in the jet fuel, applying high fuel sulfur content at aviation cruise altitudes will cool the planet. Inject sulfate aerosols emitted by aviation fuel. Link, 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 link. JP-8 doped with sulfur was tested just recently at the access flights. Stratospheric sulfate injection with commercial aircraft. Commercial aircraft could be used to deliver sulfate in the stratosphere by increasing fuel sulfur content in the flight altitude and intercontinental flights. The fuel, the sulfur content of the fuel should be rate increased by about 50 times the current level to have a significant cooling effect. The cooling effect would be confined to the northern hemisphere. Screw all you brown people in the southern hemisphere. Us northerners are going to take care of our own by jet fuel geoengineering. By the way, Ben Kravitz in the 
Inter, uh, Integrated Assessment of Geoengineering Proposals, IAGP, said that geoengineering with this method would decrease rainfall in the Southern Hemisphere and increase rainfall in the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, wait, is this also about water wars and about killing people? Because when you control the global climate and you mimic a volcano by putting sulfur into the stratosphere, it's going to change rainfall on a worldwide basis. And that is going to dry up the Southern Hemisphere. Screw you guys. They don't care. So back to um, weather modification history. ICAO, or the International Civil Aviation Organization, a UN body, adopts intentional contrail cirrus geoengineering policy. This comes from Ulrich Schumann from Germany's DLR. It's kind of like their version of NASA. And he said, we want less soot emissions, less warming, more cooling contrails. What is he talking about there? So it turns out that What's up, mama? <laughs> um, it turns out that when planes make clouds, they create a blanket. And that blanket insulates the planet. And the heat cannot escape back to space. So it turns out that not only are these clouds screwing up the skies, they may be melting the poles. And that's exactly what they've talked about doing for 100 years. You can go back to the front page of Weather Modification History and read all about that. How they've been trying for 100 years to melt the poles to get to the oil and gas. Um, links and details on that right here. So he actually said this at the ICAO Colloquium on Aviation and Climate Change in 2010. And here it is right here. Less soot emissions, less warming more cooling contrails. This is not a conspiracy anymore. This is an operation predictable for operational planning. Now, how would you predict this for operational planning? How would you, you know, predict um, when you're going to create these clouds and if they're going to cool or if they're going to heat the planet? Well, they do it because he also invented this. Ulrich Schumann did. The Contrail Sim Cirrus Simulation and Prediction Tool, COSIP. And it basically says, you know, hey, what's the life cycle cover, radiation balance of this? Simulation, LIDAR satellites, N C two. N C two means on site, so fly up there behind the planes, which they are doing with the access flights and the N D Max flights. Um, so that they can predict when the clouds are going to be made, if they're going to heat the planet, if they're going to cool the planet, are they going to have to pay carbon taxes or are they going to get carbon credits? That's what this is all about now. And uh, you can see right here, um, contrails of larger aircraft are thicker and stay longer than smaller ones. More soot causes smaller ice particles, which sediment later and cause longer contrails, therefore. So, more the the new high bypass jet engines they're they're more likely to create clouds than before because they're more efficient and they want to put a whole bunch of sulfur in there next up jet biofuel enlisted for contrail control now this is something else because these biofuels are part of something called the Alternative Fuel Effects on Contrails and Cruise Emission, Access Flights. And they're testing these biofuels for contrail control because apparently biofuels should have less soot. The thing is, they want to put less soot in the fuel when they're taking off to kill less people around airports because of the aforementioned black belch. Um, it's the black soot that you did. So, you know, if anybody lives near a major airport, they've got black dust all over their house. They know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, but once you get up to altitude, you want to make sure that you put a whole bunch of sulfur in that jet fuel and that way you can cool the planet. So it goes like this. Um, you know, this is what complete combustion should look like. This is what the debunkers talk about. CO2 plus water plus SO2. Um, that's what it should look like, but that's not what actually ever happens. And it even says it right here, actual combustion products. CO2 plus NOx plus SOx plus HC plus CO plus H2O plus BC. BC being black carbon. Sounds down here. Alternative jet fuels will have no sulfur-related emissions 
and have lower black carbon emissions. Other emissions could be lower. And, uh, but that's not the case. In the end, they're actually putting more sulfur in the fuel when they get up to altitude. And how does this affect everything? Well, you could see a little flow chart here. Uh, changes in radiative forcing components, aerosol cloud interactions, black carbon does that. Um, climate change, changes in temperature, sea level ice, snow precipitation, impacts agriculture, forestry, ecosystems, energy production like solar power. When you make a bunch of clouds, you block out solar power. So people who are a solar industry should be suing through the nose for this stuff and consumption, human health, social effects. Social effects being all the people freaking out online about chemtrails. That's a pretty big social effect. Damages, social welfare and costs. So this is damaging the environment, damaging people's minds. Um, you know, just a whole lot of effects associated with this. So they're actually, I said, flying up there in C2 to test these biofuels for contrail control. And right about here, you can see, look, there they are. And you can see their little particle readouts. Oh, how much metal's in there? How much soot's in there? Red line, ultra fine particles. Blue line, fine particle concentration. Black, non-volatile -vol particle concentration. Uh, these are what they're probing for. They want to see, A, what kind of clouds are we making with these jet fuels? This is the alternative fuel effects on contrails and cruise emission data time series. Um, got lots of uh, research on this. You can see it right here, some more videos on that. Yeah. And there's the plane flying behind the other plane, sucking up see you sucking up the chemtrails, doing little tests with little tubes on the wingtips and everything. They're testing the chemtrails. Access flights. I actually interviewed the head of the access flights. His name is Dr. Rangasai Halthori. He's from the FAA's Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative. And during that interview, he made the statement that was similar to what Ulrich Schumann said. We want to make clouds by day, none by night. The reason why they want to make clouds by day and none by night is because during the day, clouds do solar radiation management. And at night, they do something different called earth radiation management, ERM. Everybody's heard of SRM, geoengineering, solar radiation management. When you make clouds, it blocks the incoming sunlight and some of it gets reflected to space. But the heat that hits the ground at night should bounce off the ground and go back to space. The problem is it can't because there's a cloud layer and that cloud layer is insulating that heat. This is called earth radiation management. So in order to get rid of this heat that should be traveling back to space, they don't want to make clouds at night anymore. That's their big plan to use biofuels, um, sulfur dope jet fuel, and melt clouds away at night. That's their new plan. Biofuels, by the way, are going to lead to way more climate change because now they're growing gasoline. With things like the J. Trofa plant, Camelina plant, hell, they're making it out of chicken fat gasoline. Look it up. Turning your landfill waste into jet fuel. It's called the Fisher Tropes process. Um, lots of information on that. FICA Cool product um, project right here. This is March 2013. <coughs> Another technique examined was the use of commercial air passenger aircraft flying at high altitudes to inject sulfate aerosols emitted by aviation fuel into the stratosphere. Commercial aircraft could be used to deliver the sulfate into the atmosphere. I showed you that right here. And you can obviously go to the links right here on web.archive.org because they deleted their FICA Cool page. But of course, you know me, I backs everything up. So there's their thing, studying geoengineering with a climate model, and that's where these pictures came from. Check it out yourself. Um, they even talk a little bit about using ship tracks in there with the fun stuff, sea spray injections. 
Um, but anyway, marine cloud brightening is what it's called, or marine cloud whitening with sea with sea spray. So um, these are geoengineering proposals to make clouds. That's what's going on here. Finally, what I just mentioned about melting the clouds away is called cirrus cloud seeding or cirrus cloud thinning. And they say, you know, it's a great idea, but we need to make sure we don't overseed the sky because if you put too many seeds in the sky, you can actually shut off precipitation. Meaning, if you have just the right amount of dust and just the right amount of water vapor and the right amount of static, they stick together and then they get big enough and they fall on the ground. The problem is if there's not enough water vapor up in the sky right here and there are way too many seeds, these drops never get big enough to fall. They just float around and float around. That's called overseeding. Overseeding the sky with aerosols, dust, soot, metal coming from planes is a, a great way to cause a drought. And that's exactly what's going on. So, you know, of course they say, they call this thermal radiation management or TRM. Gotta love all these terms. Solar radiation management, e, um, SRM, earth radiation management, ERM. And these guys are calling cirrus cloud seeding thermal radiation management, TRM, but it's also earth radiation management. TRM is ERM. My God, there's a lot of scientific terms today. Idea, inject highly efficient ice nuclei into cirrus forming regions, create competition effect between homogeneous and heterogeneous uh, ice formation. Larger and heavy ice crystals can form ice cloud depletion. Remove the long wave trapping cirrus and upper tropospheric water vapor. Suggested seeding material, bismuth triiodide. Pepto-bismol. That's right. Bismuth triiodide. So they want to spray Pepto-bismol into the clouds to melt them away at night. Seeding via commercial airliners? Advantage. Seeding aerosol residence time is relatively short in the troposphere. This is not done in the stratosphere. They're talking about doing this in the troposphere where we live down here on the ground. Uh, where the planes are flying. Drawback does not address ocean acidification. Acid rain, people. It's going to suck. So I told you earlier, we would like to make clouds by day, none by night. Paper right there, FAA scientists, we want to make clouds by day, none by night on climateviewer.com. But here's the smoking gun paper, and this comes straight from Ken Caldera, world's most hated geoengineer. Climate change and geoengineering, artificially cooling planet Earth by thinning cirrus clouds. This was also called the cocktail geoengineering paper. And in that paper, he said, the maximum cirrus seeding potential would be achieved by removing all cirrus clouds, they write. If cirrus thinning works, it should be preferred over methods that target changes in solar radiation, such as stratospheric aerosol injections, because cirrus thinning would counteract greenhouse gas warming more directly. I'm going to translate that for you. If they can melt the chemtrails away, they'll never have to do geoengineering solar radiation management. So you need to put on your tinfoil hat for talking about chemtrails and, and cirrus clouds, you know, coming out of planes because you're crazy. But they say, if we just melt the damn clouds away, we'll never have to do geoengineering. That's pretty shocking to me. Um, and it gets even better here in this next quote. If the time and place of seeding is selected with care, the climate effect of cirrus thinning can be enhanced. For that, only the long wave warming effect of cirrus clouds should be targeted. Because hell, we want to make a bunch of money in carbon credits for cooling the planet with these clouds we're making. So let's only target the long wave warming effect of cirrus clouds because then we can still make a bunch of carbon credits, not carbon taxes. And their solar effect should be avoided. Target the long wave warming effect of cirrus clouds should be targeted and their solar effect should be avoided. This can be achieved if seeding is limited to high latitude winters 
or nighttime seeding. There you go. Burn the chemtrails away at night and do it up around the North Pole. So that's exactly what I've been seeing for the past year in Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, my morning starts out sunny. Uh, the planes start coming overhead. I got clouds all damn day long. And then magically, every freaking night almost, with very rare um, you know, occurrences where it doesn't happen, all the clouds go away and the stars are out all night long. And the very next day, it happens again. Is this a coincidence? I think not. So this is what cirrus cloud seeding looks like. It's up here near the tropos, tropopause. This is where they want to do it. Um, these are the different types of cirrus clouds that they're targeting. Orographic cirrus, mid-latitude cirrus. Um, and these are all around where the planes are flying. Uh, tropical tropopause cirrus. 46,000 to 59,000 feet. 30 to 39,000 feet, 30 to 42,000 feet. These are, these are the problem. And guess what? All of these are made of metal. 75% of the cloud seeds found in cirrus clouds are made of man-made metals. This is from a paper called a cirrus cloud climate dial. I made this infographic, by the way, to illustrate this from one of their graphics. I just added the plane and showed <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, how seeding cirrus clouds could cool the climate right here. Cirrus clouds reflect some sunlight and absorb long wave radiation. On balance, they warm the climate. Cirrus cloud thinning aims to change the radiated properties of cirrus clouds by reducing their lifetime and the altitude at which they form. And you can see right here, they got a drone up here shooting out ice nucleating particles INPs this is a new term I don't know why the hell they keep changing terminology since uh, 1946 when cloud seeding was inventing they were called cloud condensation nuclei CCN now all the damn geoengineers are calling calling them INPs or ice nucleating particles blah 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 blah, blah. it's all a bunch of slave speak but regardless this is what they're trying to do now. They're trying to burn away or thin out the cirrus cloud so that they still do some solar radiation management during the day, but at night all that heat can go back to space. Um, and here's a uh, from Trude Story Elmo's uh, paper that she did at the Weather Modification Conference, I believe, in 2010. And it says right there, use bismuth triiodide seeding via commercial airlines. Hell, they could put the Pepto-Bismol in the jet fuel. That's pretty crazy. And here is their her paper. Her and paper is called wait. On the Climate Response to Cirrus Cloud Seeding. This is from the 2015 Weather Modification Conference. Rent homogeneous ice nuclear. Explain how that could actually come about. I need to review how uh, ice crystals form in cirrus clouds. And so they can form uh, through two different ice nucleation mechanisms. So there's homogeneous nucleation in which uh, solution droplets in the upper troposphere, which there are many of, uh, can freeze spontaneously if the supersaturation is high enough. So a supersaturation of about 50% or higher would allow for... Um, what supersaturation? What the hell is this lady talking about? We'll get into that right here. So, doped fuel sulfur content geoengineering. This is your smoking gun paper. This is where the rubber meets the road. This scientific paper pretty much lays it out. Applying high fuel sulfur content at aviation cruise altitudes combined with ultra low sulfur jet fuel at lower altitude results in a reduced aviation induced mortality an increased negative RE compared to the baseline aviation scenario. Translation, using biofuels on takeoff will kill less people around airports because they have less soot. And using high fuel sulfur content at aviation cruise altitude will cool the planet. So I, I scratched my head and I was like, how the hell are they going to do that? I mean, how do you put two jet fuels in one plane? That's the thing that I couldn't figure out for the longest time. And then I did. 
David Key said, photophoretic levitation could loft particles above the stratosphere, reducing their capacity to interfere with ozone chemistry. He's talking about soot and how soot is black and how it can levitate itself through the stratosphere. So the soot comes out of planes and it goes up. Mm, now that's interesting. And the Indian Space uh, Organization said, they now have evidence that such particles, black carbon, existing up to 18 kilometers in the stratosphere, and they say there are about 10,000 of them in every cubic centimeter. So what do they say? Given the shape and location of these black carbon particles, they argue it could only derive from emissions from aviation fuel. And they pose a problem because these black carbon particles can linger long enough to provide a fertile ground for other chemical reactions that can deplete the ozone layer. So they were pretty, the Indian Space Organization literally said that black carbon emissions from jet aircraft are screwing with the ozone layer, affecting their monsoon, and a whole bunch of other effects. Well, U.S. Patent 9518965 a percentage of at least one fuel composition and a second fuel composition required to produce a resultant fuel composition that will create a vapor trail that, that cools the planet. Here are those patents right here. Fuel system for vapor trail control. That's the patent number. And as you can see, it's coming out of the jet engine. There are two fuel tanks. There are multiple fuel tanks in these planes. They can mix them at will. Oh wait, the pilot doesn't have to know a damn thing about this. This can all be done remotely. <clears throat> now, in that little video I played you, they talked about supersaturation. Well, these are called ISSRs, or ice supersaturated regions. They're water bubbles in the sky. So these water bubbles in the sky, they say, well, you know, if it's going to heat the planet up, let's avoid them. But if we can actually pull this off during the day and it's going to make clouds that are going to cool the planet, let's fly right through them because, hey, that's a good thing, right? Carbon credits versus carbon taxes. Two jet fuels, one tank, contrail control. This is called fuel delivery system. U.S. Patent Application 2013-034-0834. And then the big smoking gun paper. Control unit and method of controlling the supply of a vehicle with multiple fuels. Now we get to the real conspiracy. Using two jet fuels in one plane and the Jet Fuel Electronic Control Unit, ECU. Here's the patent number. They can create clouds and then stop creating clouds on off clouds on off clouds there you go and you can watch my video on that biofuels for Contra Welcome control climate viewers my and i have a whole bunch more videos on that but yes this is this is how it works this is the truth this is the new plan jet fuel doping putting sulfur into the sky um these are the facts and i said a lot of these facts when I went to the EPA hearing on jet pollution in 2015 and I brought my homeboys with me, uh, you can see us right here. That's uh, me and Amanda Bays, a.k.a. Madison Star Moon and Patrick Roddy and Max Bliss. We went up to Washington, D.C. and on C-SPAN told them, hey, you know, um, I'm more concerned about planes making clouds and uh, putting metal particles in the sky than I am about greenhouse gases. So why don't you guys do something about that? And similar to the lawsuit back in, uh, you know, 1970, the airline industry once again escaped regulation. And they got away scot-free. And I tried to get everybody to submit comments. You can see it right here. Um, I put some images out there. I even showed people here's where to support, you know, submit your stuff. This is from the C-SPAN site and all that. Submitting comment on docket ID, you know, here's how to please speak up. I was actually trolled very hard by the chemtrail community for even doing this. 
Um, and there are still a couple jerks that are still trolling me to this day over this. But you know what? We went all the way there. We came, we saw, we conquered. It was pretty epic. I took a train, by the way. I didn't fly. Would have been kind of tacky, don't you think? And it did a GoFundMe to get me there. Pretty epic. In water. Yet, raw fuel dumping or burning these chemicals, dangerous chemicals and then dumping them in water is somehow safe. Finally, despite great efforts to find bioaccumulation or biomagnification studies on precipitated aviation pollutants, none seem to exist. Change to diagnose or, or hide the incidents, but the fact of the matter is more children are receiving services today than they were, and they will continue to receive more services over the next 10 years. That's Michael Saraceno talking about how metal particles coming out of planes are causing Alzheimer's and autism. So this is a growing body of scientific evidence. What is in the air that we are breathing? One chemtrail activist from California decided to have, excuse me, decided to have his hair tested for heavy metals at his own expense. High levels of strontium and barium were uncovered. I have a copy of his lab results that he voluntarily sent to me. Look at those smug faces. They're like, oh my God, this is happening. I cannot believe this is happening. Post this document Unbelievable. On page, Madison's Photophoretic levitation of engineered aerosols for geoengineering proposes spraying 50 nanometer thick disks of aluminum, barium, titanium instead of sulfates. Pope et al. also concluded aluminum nanoparticles are much more effective than sulfates in a 2010 perspective in nature climate change. That's Patrick Roddy killing it. And finally, uh, Max Bliss. Max Bliss. The UK Civil Aviation Authority responded to the concerns of fume incidents. The 2004 investigation into cabin air quality found that the peak particulate matter found in the air ducts was aluminium. 1967, wood had natural variability and we do not consent to the use of modification technology known as geoengineering for geopolitical ends. We do not need to be scientists to observe the sky and see the obvious negative effects aviation is having and research the spiraling health impacts. Just start looking up and wake up. We do not consent to the use of weather and climate modification or the despotic new world order. God bless and peace for all. That is Freaky Max Bliss dropping New World Order in front of the EPA. Oh my God, it was the best day ever. Um, if you haven't watched this, you really need to watch this uh, hearing. It's pretty epic. Um, we killed it. And you know what? What do they do about it? Breaking EPA to limit greenhouse gases from airplanes. Well, you know... Wait a minute, EPA, you can't regulate the airline industry. That would be horrible because, you know, us globalists love to fly. So what happens? Obama and company put the brakes on that really quick. This happened July 25th, 2016. July 31st, 2016, like a week later, White House releases Federal Alternative Jet Fuel Research and Development Strategy. Biofuels for contrail control in full effect. September 3rd, 2016, China, U.S., Europe pledged support for Global Aviation Emissions Pact. That's the ICAO regulating itself again, just like it happened in the 1970s. Finally, Greens moved to dismiss EPA lawsuit over airplane emissions, and they threw it all out. So, just like in the 70s, much to do of nothing, no regulations for the airline industry, no accountability for them creating clouds worldwide, no, uh, you know, no cookies for all of us who are pretty pissed off about it. That's what happened. And then you have this commercial aviation, creating ice haze and accidental geoengineering Chuck Long from NASA's, uh, Earth from, Air Systems Research Lab, CRES, long suggests that ice alt high altitude ice haze 
created by water and other emissions from aircraft, other emissions being metal, is responsible. I'm talking about a subvisual contrail generated haze of ice, which we do not classify as a cloud, but gives the blue sky a more whitish tint. And that is from, you can still see it to this day, this is over on Smithsonian Mag. Airplane contrails may be creating accidental geoengineering. So if you look up and you see blue, but you look at the horizon and it looks super white, that's what he's talking about. Not even the clouds. The clouds are enough of a pain in the ass, but they're also putting so much ice into the sky that it's actually cr changing the color of the sky and brightening it, making it whiter. And that is what they're calling accidental geoengineering. These are not accidents. That's why I wrote a paper about it. Um, let's go to that first. Accidental geoengineering with ship tracks and contrails. And I hope that you guys will dig into this one. I published it over on MIT University's Climate X website. You can see that here. Boom. This is MIT Climate X. Accidental geoengineering with ship tracks and contrails. Pretty amazing lengthy report on that. If you haven't heard about ship tracks, uh, you probably should. They make chemtrails look tiny. Um, but these happen over the ocean with um, international shipping. That is, you see right there, it says 50 kilometers. So that's 50, 100, 200, 300, 400. These are states long, monstrously large chemtrails all over the Pacific Ocean. So between planes, and they said for these ship tracks, similar to the accidental geoengineering, we're about to kill a massive accidental experiment in reducing global warming with ship tracks. So let me get this straight. Planes making clouds is an accidental geoengineering and ships making clouds is an accidental geoengineering experiment also. These are no longer accidents. These are intentional, especially when you've got jackasses like this saying a forthcoming UN regulation will slash shipping industry pollution, but it may also speed up climate change. And they are specifically talking about, you know, a, a law that's going to say stop using bunker fuel in ships to make clouds, because guess what that bunker fuel is loaded with sulfur. So between airlines putting sulfur into the stratosphere and ships putting sulfur into the sky. They're all trying to mimic volcanoes by putting sulfur into the sky. That's what this all has in common. That's the real conspiracy. The real conspiracy is how jets make metal clouds. And what did they find when they actually tested them? The detected metallic compounds were internally mixed with soot particles. Just like I've been saying all along. Soot is the carrier. Soot takes the metal up into the sky. Soot makes the clouds. The metals free themselves from the soot on the way up. The Indian Space Organization found the soot at 18 kilometers in the sky. The most abundant metals in the exhaust were chromium, iron, molybdenum, sodium, calcium, calcium, and aluminum. Also detected vanadium, barium, cobalt, copper, nickel, lead, magnesium, manganese, silicone, titanium, and zirconium. All of these freaking metals are coming out of planes. They're making clouds. And guess what? Breathing metals, bad for your brain. Considering that some fraction of soot can effectively act as an ice nucleating particle, INP, I hate that. It's a CCN for damn sake. Um, and that dominant fraction of ice residuals in cirrus clouds contain metal compounds. The dominant fraction of ice residuals in cirrus clouds contain me metal compounds. The presented findings support the assumption that aircraft engine emissions can act as ice nucleating particles. So these are the facts guys you can read all about it i did a great paper on this aluminum barium and chemtrails just the facts here's the two um scientific papers physical and chemical characterization of non-volatile aircraft engine exhaust ulrich lohman um 
The chemical characterization of freshly emitted particulate matter from aircraft exhaust using single particle mass spectrometry. And uh, this is the paper that's the smoking gun right here. Black carbon from aircraft exhaust is destroying ozone, melting the poles. And this comes from the Indian Space Organization. Though airborne black carbon is known to dissipate and settle down in a few months under influence of rain and wind, it is unlikely to travel upwards of four kilometers. However, a group of scientists, including from the Indian Institute of Science and ISRO's Vikram Sarabi Space Center, say they have now evidence of such particles existing up to 18 kilometers in the stratosphere and there are about 10,000 of them per every cubic centimeter. Given the shape and location of the particles, they argue it could only derive the emissions from aviation fuel. And they pose a problem because the black carbon particles can linger long enough to provide a fertile ground for other chemical reactions that deplete the ozone layer. Um, airplanes may be affecting ozone and monsoon articles on that. This is new news just happened. Um, right there. Airplanes may be affecting ozone layer. Black carbon heats up atmosphere. They retitled this. It did say monsoons and stuff on it, but, and this is dated August 15th, 2017. So the words getting out there, scientists are starting to catch up on all this stuff, but at the end of the day, it, cirrus clouds matter. Um, whether it's a chemtrail, whether it's a contrail, me and my daughter, we call them plain farts, whatever you want to call them. When those clouds fan out and block out the sun and screw with the, the radiation balance of the planet, they heat up the poles, they make acid rain, and obviously piss off a lot of people online, that these clouds are cirrus clouds. That's what they turn into, whether it's a, you know, I've got all the terms right here. You can read them. Chemtrails, persistent contrails, spreading contrails, contrail cirrus, contrail induced cirrus, contrail induced cloudiness, con aviation induced cloudiness, aviation induced cirrus, induced cirrus cloudiness, man-made clouds. They're all artificial clouds. So if you want to read my articles on climateviewer.com, Simply come up here to the top, go to archives, click on artificial clouds. You can read all my articles about this and get yourself educated. Come over here to Cirrus Clouds Matter. This is climateviewer.com slash Cirrus Clouds Matter. You could find it under the geoengineering section right here, right below my heart page. Or if you're on the geoengineering page, you can simply scroll down to the two subsections on this. Most of this information is already there. I hope that you guys will get educated on this because cirrus clouds truly do matter. And there's a lot of fear porn, a lot of bullshit on the internet. Um, there's a lot of guys on YouTube making a whole lot of dollars, scaring the hell out of people. And if we're going to do something about this problem, everybody needs to get educated. And then, in, in, in reality, not even everybody needs to be educated because as Margaret Mead said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So I hope that you guys are a part of that small group of thoughtful, caring individuals who will dig into this research that, that will realize that there's a lot of bunk on both sides of this story coming from the chemtrail community, coming from the, the debunker community. The scientists, they don't have a clue about what's going on. And if we all get educated on this and we start to resonate this idea that planes making soot, putting metal into the sky and creating cirrus clouds is a bad thing and that the airline industry needs to be held to account. The geoengineers who are jacking with the jet fuel need to be held to account. Um, you can do that by supporting my Environmental Modification Accountability Act. It's available at climateviewer.com slash nmod. Drop that in chat for you guys over there. Um, but that's, that's what we really need to deal with. I hope that you guys will get educated on the subject. Please share this video. Um, this is your one video that really tells the big story, the whole story, and nothing but the truth sans the fear porn. Um, and once again, everything that I just showed you is free of charge. There's no ads on my website. The only thing that I ask is you either support me on Patreon 
buy me a coffee on PayPal. I would greatly appreciate it. I'm doing these videos right now because I'm going to have surgery on my throat, have my thyroid removed um, in a week or so, and I'm not going to be able to talk for quite some time. So I want to make sure that um, you can't take back the words you never, never said. So I'm going to sum all this stuff up. A lot more research coming the rest of this week. Um, and I hope that you guys will support me. Um, if you'd like to donate to my medical bills, please help me out over here on the PayPal. And um, sign up for the newsletter. I'll keep you guys updated that way in the meantime while I'm um, recovering. But I put seven years of research into this. I know what the hell I'm talking about. And as if you guys will learn this stuff and, and start to teach others, we can do something about this. Don't believe all the demoralizers. Don't believe all the hype. Um, this is something we can fix, and it's as simple as holding the airline industry to account, holding the geoengineers to account, and you can do that by supporting the Environmental Modification Accountability Act, supporting my research, and, and, and resonating it. Share this stuff with other people so that they get educated too. Um, when you show this to scientists and you tell them, look, I don't like planes making cirrus clouds, there's nothing they can say to shut you down. And when you say, I don't like the idea that they're using biofuels for contrail control. I don't like the idea that black carbon is at 18 kilometers in the sky, destroying the ozone layer. These are scientific freaking facts. And all of the references you need to shut them up are available on climateviewer.com and weathermodificationhistory.com. I didn't even mention Climate Viewer 3D, but you can see a whole lot more on my map as well. Um, the Earth's not dying, it's being killed, and those who are killing it have names and addresses, and I just dropped a whole lot of them. So I hope that you guys will resonate this message. Please continue to support my work, and remember, most importantly, attack ideas, not people. If this video resonates with you, leave me a comment because I love hearing from you all. First time here? Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. The bell doesn't always work, so come to climateviewer.com and sign up for our newsletter. Remember, it would be impossible for me to do this without your support, so please join my Patreon or buy me a coffee on PayPal. And always, attack ideas, not people.